FOMO. FOMO, fear of missing out. And I also put, to put you know, decision making, problems with decision making in there. And it's certainly one of the soft, soft symptoms of ADHD to look for. Um, it's not in the diagnostic criteria, but it's certainly uh, something I look for. But yeah, poor decision making and inability to make decisions and insecurity about decisions is really a hallmark of ADHD. That's Dr. George Sachs, a psychologist specializing in the treatment of ADHD. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens. When the world's spinning out of control, it can be impossible to know what to do and what to miss out on. That's called FOMO, which is short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term and I'm the world's first FOMologist. And this is the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers, people I call FOMO sapiens, how they live and work with conviction no matter what life throws at them. FOMO. FOMO. Hey, FOMO sapiens, welcome back. Another episode. Before we get into the episode, I do want to remind you that we have a new website, FOMOSapiens.com. If you go there, you can find more about the show. You can listen to all the past episodes. And while you're there, you can click through and subscribe and rank the show, give it a rating. Uh, it would mean so much to me if you subscribe and share it with friends. So you can do all those things from the website. Check it out. I'm really proud of the website. And it is something new that we have put together just for you. And hopefully we'll be adding more and more resources there in the future. It's on the product roadmap. I have all the FOMO to do it, but of course, just have to get it done. And, and of course, to get that done, I'm gonna need to focus. And today we're gonna be talking about focus. In particular, we're gonna talk about ADHD. That is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. This is a term that I've heard for a million years. I know friends who have been diagnosed with ADHD. I have not, uh, even though I am sometimes all over the place. But to be honest with you, I really didn't know much about the topic and I was interested in this because I heard about its connections with FOMO. ADHD and FOMO are highly linked and that makes sense. If you think about it, all of the things that we feel when we have FOMO and then the things that you might feel when you have ADHD, which we'll be talking about today, I can see how they are connected. And so I wanted to ask an expert because frankly, I wanted to understand ADHD and FOMO, how they come together and how they drive people's behavior. Dr. George Sachs is a licensed child and adult psychologist specializing in the treatment of ADD and ADHD and autism spectrum disorders. He did his clinical training in Chicago at Cook County Hospital and at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and at the Child Studied Center. He also consulted to the Juilliard School in New York City, where he worked with dancers and drama students and orchestral students. He's written books, including The Adult ADD Solution, and he's been on TV, on NBC and CBS, and many other major media outlets. He's in private practice in Manhattan, and he is the perfect person to talk about this topic. And what more, he has a personal connection to ADHD that I found really interesting, and we'll get into that. But before we do, I wanted to start our interview by asking George to explain what exactly is ADHD? Well, ADHD is a uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, and it begins in in utero, really. I mean, we're born with it in most cases. I mean, there's some other extenuating circumstances and cases where ADHD can appear in childhood or, or, or later, but most of us are born with it. It's inherited from a parent or grandparent. And so when I'm evaluating somebody for ADHD, I, I ask about their parents or grandparents, and inevitably there's a parent that's disorganized or has problems with focus and attention. So it's something we're born with, and it uh, affects many areas of our life. In fact, they're recharacterizing ADHD to be a problem of what they call executive functioning, and as opposed to just focus and attention. And executive functioning includes things like planning, decision-making, uh, organizing, and impulsivity, managing emotions. So in a way, it affects all areas of our lives, which can be really challenging. Um, it shows up differently as a child. So, you know, you have a stereotypical hyperactive 10-year-old boy who can't sit still, but also you may have a a girl or a boy who is um, spacey and kind of out of it and quiet and doesn't get noticed because of that. You know, as we get older, the real executive functioning problems happen. 
Uh, so, you know, you're going to see problems in getting things done, getting started, organizing, planning, um, decision making. And, and so that's, you know, inevitably what when when I see adults, that's what some of the problems are. And they show up in work and in relationships. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what ADHD is. Now, you mentioned the spacey boy. So you, you know, you you chose this to focus your career on this. And and this has real relevance to your own life. So how did you end up getting into the work that you do today? Well, uh, it was kind of a circuitous route. I I, ma I majored in psychology and in uh, I went to Emory University in Atlanta. But uh, because of my own executive functioning problems, it, you know, it was like I dragged myself across the finish line, so to speak, and graduated. And the concept of going back to graduate school at that point was just a furthest thing from my mind. Uh, so I, I went to Asia, uh, like many people, I think of my generation and maybe still and taught English and then ended up staying there for a few years um, and had an amazing time. And then I came back and um, went into media and rode the dot-com bubble of the 90s and lived in Manhattan and had an amazing time. But the bubble crashed. And also what I noticed is that I wasn't really um, finding my groove there, so to speak. And I wasn't the one that was promoted or tapped in any of the companies I worked for. So I, I was kind of struggling. Uh, and then, you know, 9-11 happened and I was, it was, you know, for many people, it was just an opportunity to reevaluate our lives. And it was at that point that I said, you know, well, actually it was my mother you know, and only mothers can do, she kind of said in one sit down, you know, you're really probably better suited for helping people and a kind of softer. She actually said, George, you know, you're, you're soft. <laughs> and now I take that as a compliment. But at that time I was just, it was a young adult and I thought of myself as like a tech entrepreneur, but you know, I, I took the advice to heart and I, and I went back to graduate school to become a psychologist. And it was a, the best decision I ever made because for people with ADHD, we really need structure. And uh, I myself have ADHD, so I needed the kind of long-term plan. And graduate school is six, seven years. And so it was kind of like blinders on a horse, you know, like this is what you're gonna be doing. You can't get distracted. And I tried, I tried to distract myself, but graduate school is like, one hoop of fire after another, and I just uh, had to move forward. I wanted to focus on children, and um, when you work with kids in graduate school and in, as a psychologist, ADHD is really the primary uh, problem you work with. And then in the process of learning about that, I, I took my own tests and realized, oh my God, I have this, this is me. This is what I had my whole life. Tell me about that moment when you realized, you know, you're, you're, you, you sort of self-diagnosed that you, in fact, had ADHD. How did you, how did you realize it, and, and what did that feel like to recognize that this, this was something that was part of you and that maybe had held you back in, in some of the things you'd done in the past? Well, um, it's an interesting question. I think I was kind of blind to my own issues, and I think for like a lot of people, when you get to your late 20s and things are not clicking— you know, then we have to self-evaluate and say, well, everyone else seems to be moving forward with their lives in their 20s and, and launching, so to speak, and why am I not doing that? So that was the first kind of like, whoa, there might be a problem here. Even though I barely made it through, through college, you know, I graduated, and it wasn't until my late 20s where I started saying, wow, I have a problem. And it was then that I first th saw a therapist and so, yeah, when I, a few years later, when I took the test for adults, um, I, I was shocked and I just thought, oh my God, this is, this is it. I'm thinking back now whether, how helpful that was. When I diagnose people in my office, they are very relieved. I think it just left me with more questions and, and other uh, things like that. I diagnose, diagnosed myself, so I, I didn't have the support of somebody saying, okay, next step is this and then you do this, but that's how it happened. And uh, I was happy to know like that, what, why I am the way I am. So I can imagine that there are people listening right now, and frankly, I'm thinking this too, 
I'm thinking about people that I know or even myself and wondering, well, maybe I have some of these attributes. So if somebody's listening to this today and they want to know how to look for the signs that they might have ADHD and that they should go get tested or, or work with somebody like yourself, like what can they look for? Okay. Well, I think the first thing is, is there a problem? And we have to be honest with ourselves. And often people come to me and there's a problem. They were laid off. Their partner is considering leaving. Um, so, you know, the criteria in the final criteria in the DSM, which is the book, the big book of all the diagnostic criteria and the disorders is uh, that the psychiatrists and psychologists use. The final criteria is, is there an impairment in functioning, which really means is how is there a problem? Because everybody's impulsive and distracted and things like that. But if you have a if it if it rises to the level of a real problem, then it might be ADHD. So that's the first thing people can think about is, you know, are things not really going well? And if that box is checked, then they can look at another really common problem is just procrastination. Getting started on tasks is really hard. And that's kind of a real common denominator. Now, of course, if you're super depressed, you, you're not going to get started on tasks too. So we have to rule that out in the evaluation. But generally, it's just so many unfinished projects. You start things but lose interest. There's a, there's a kind of disorganized quality to your life, not just in your living space and working space, but how you approach life starts and stops and things like that. And then there's the emotional dysregulation, which is, you know, the real problem of impatience that rises to, you know, real anger issues, explosive anger and things like that. So a lot of people sometimes say, I think I'm bipolar, but um, the difference is, is that, you know, with bipolar, generally the emotions are all over the place, but they're not based on triggers. So with ADHD, you know, it's like if you wait in the bank line too long, you might explode, you know, because of the trigger, because of impatience. Or like for me, one of my triggers is uh, customer service reps. It's very hard for me to maintain my, uh, my calm on those calls. So that's another uh, symptom people can look out for. When somebody walks into your office for the first time, now I'm curious, what do you actually do in terms of the different types of tests? I mean, you, you obviously want to rule things out and you look at if they're, they're suffering from some of the outcomes that we just talked about and you mentioned, but what are the actual tests that you will run with them to figure out what diagnosis they have? Our evaluation is two hours and it's comprehensive in the sense of um, doing real testing and also the clinical interview. Some people are uh, calling me and saying they, they heard that they need to do a full neuropsychological assessment, which is, you know, eight hours and $5,000. And it's not necessary for a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, so those tests are needed if you want to get extra time on the SAT or accommodations. But to get a diagnosis of ADHD, you just need a really good specialist and two hours should be enough. So we do an interview and we'll learn about your childhood symptoms and your family life and any history in the family of, of ADHD or mental illness. And then we learn about your current problems. And then I'll give you a number of different tests, you know, that our psychologists give and are normed against people with ADHD and then people without. So we can see where you fall on that spectrum. Uh, so then at the end, I, we crunch the numbers and then I'll look at, you know, the data and my sense from the clinical interview and I'll give you my um, opinion whether I think you have ADHD or not. And how common is this? Uh, when we think about the general population, what percentage of people suffer from ADHD? Well, it's about 5% in the adult population. You, you mentioned, as you look back in people's in their medical history and their family history. And I'm curious, I think sometimes we think about this and we think, well, you know, this is a, this is a common thing in our modern era because of all the devices and the distractions. But I guess what I'm hearing from you is this is part of the human experience and has been for, you know, for generations. Is that correct? Yeah. In fact, there's a, a wonderful book called Hunter in a Farmer's World. 
and I forgot the author's name, but the concept is that this, there's a genetic, there's a gene for ADHD, and I'm not a, a scientist in that way, but I can only assume there might be, and um, that this gene had a value, you know, 10,000 years ago when we were when we were hunter and gatherers, and we had to think quickly, and you know, um, but as we as society changed, and now we're at desks and in cubicles, it's it's no longer an attribute. I think this has been around since it's it's encoded in the, the human DNA, but I do think that our modern society with all the distractions has made, and also the sedentary st- sedentariness of it has made it worse or more pronounced. Now, I, I was doing a little research this week and I found on Twitter, there's a woman, uh, Rish with ADHD. It's her, her Twitter handle is adulting ADHD. And she asked a question uh, that got a lot of play. Actually, a lot of people wrote back to her that was, does anyone else think FOMO, fear of missing out, is heightened because of ADHD? And one of the responses I I thought was interesting, the person said, yes, so much FOMO for so many reasons. Uh, They don't go to the events because they're anxious. They can't decide what to do. So their FOMO uh, has, has them sort of stuck. They feel FOMO at the thing because they can't enjoy it because everyone else is overthinking. They're overstimulated. So there's a, there was a lot of connections that this person identified. Now, as somebody who works with patients and yourself has ADHD, w- tell me about what you what you view as the connections with FOMO. Well, it's interesting. I mean, FOMO, fear of missing out, and and um, I also put put you know decision making problems with decision making in there, and it's it's uh, it's certainly one of the soft soft symptoms of ADHD to look for. Um, it's not in the diagnostic criteria, but it's certainly uh, something I look for. But yeah, poor decision making and inability to make decisions and insecurity about decisions is really a hallmark of ADHD. So I think that there's a real strong connection between FOMO and ADHD. So I know I, I've struggled with that my whole life. You know, I think if you grow up with ADHD, you feel like what whatever you have or whatever you're doing is not good enough. It's kind of a chronic uh, self-esteem issue with ADHD. That's really you know another hallmark. And when you have uh, chronic self-esteem issues, it, it, you know you're not grounded in yourself and your own decisions and your own identity. And so what we do is we look at the other. What are they doing? What are you know then I, you know like in high school? Well, what are they wearing? What are they doing? I need to do that so I fit in. Uh, we're always, uh, with ADHD, there's a, you know, it's actually, um, something called, uh, rejection sensitive dysphoria. Basically the feeling that if you have ADHD, you're, you're sensitive to rejection. So if you're sensitive to rejection, you're always scanning the environment. What, you know, what are they doing? What do they have? You know, how can I be accepted? And I think that's kind of the basis of FOMO. It's like, what, what am I missing out on that I should be doing? And if I did it, then I would be somehow better. In talking to some um, psych- psychologists, as I researched the book I wrote about this topic, one of the things that, that I learned that I thought was really powerful was the fact that when people are feeling FOMO, they are not focused on their present life and what they have. They're focused on what they don't have and what other people have, even if that isn't true, right? It's perception-based. And so then you're disconnected from reality, and that's where the pathology begins, right? So I can see how that that connection makes sense. Now, now, now that we've laid out the issues I guess, you know, I'd love to get into the solution. So, you know, you're, you're working with a patient. It could be a a young child or it could be an adult. I know you work with both and they, they have ADHD, you've diagnosed it. So what are the things that you do to help them to live a life that is more decisive, has less FOMO and obviously allows them to manage their ADHD? Because ADHD affects all areas of our lives from managing emotions to organization, um, there's not one tool that's gonna, it's not like fear of fear of flying, you know, just expose yourself to flying if it were that easy. But with ADHD, you kind of, it is an opportunity. I wouldn't say ADHD is a gift, but I do think it's an opportunity to, to really work on yourself because it affects different areas of our lives. Now, do you typically prescribe medication or is it behavioral therapy? What are the kinds of things that that you have in the arsenal of, of tools to treat ADHD? 
Well, um, as a psychologist, I don't prescribe medicine, but I have uh, connections to doctors that do. So I can only focus on behavioral interventions. And after the, the client has accepted the diagnosis and is willing to work on it, which is not a small thing, then they um, then we'll look at their individual quirks and their individual weaknesses because you know everybody's it's like a snowflake. Everybody's is different, and then develop different strategies to to work on those those weaknesses. So, George, as somebody who's done this yourself, what are the 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 changes that you've made that you've seen have been able to be successful in, in managing your own life, making your own decisions, and moving forward successfully? With ADHD, one of my major problems was with time management and specifically being on time. And that meant, you know, being on time for appointments and things like that, but also uh, honoring deadlines. And what I didn't realize is that people like myself with ADHD, we live in the, the gray area of time, which is, oh, it's just five minutes late, relax, you know, what's the big deal? But what I didn't realize until I had joined this support group and somebody kind of with a firm voice told me that uh, because I was late, it impacted him. And I started realizing, oh, wow, like there is a lot of people in the world that don't live in this gray area of time. And if you're late by a minute or two, you're late. So I real I connected time management with relationship management. And when I made that switch, I, I realized that it's not time management. It's all about managing the relationship. And I wanted to be a person that people trusted and improved the relationship. And that was the motivation I needed to get my butt there early. And or to, when I make a commitment, it's uh, on time. So, you know, the other problem is I would get there just in the nick of time to the appointment, but I'd be sweating and and I, I call it like a clown falling out of a clown car yeah, you're on time, but you don't look very professional. So I worked on getting places on time, being cool, calm, and collected uh, to to enhance my reputation and then people would trust me. I also worked on not over committing. People with ADHD are perennial people pleasers and I was the same and I would jump to over commit. And then of course I couldn't deliver. And then again, the trust was lost. So I've been working on saying no. And uh, Warren Buffett has a great quote. He says, um, successful people say no a lot, but very successful people say no all the time. And so, you know, that's a hard word for people with ADHD to say, but I started saying no, or let me think about it before committing to things. So over time, I, I grew to be a person people can trust. So, George, I know you're actually working on building an app to help people with ADHD. Why don't you tell me about that? Yeah, it's uh, very exciting. Uh, it started over COVID. Two young tech um, entrepreneurs from from the UK contacted me. They needed an expert in ADHD. And so we, we started a new company together called Inflow. And we're building a, an app for ADHD and it, it has a learning program based on CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, uh, to help you better manage your um, ADHD. And there's also other features like we have challenges that you can take to, to, um, you know, to build new habits. And there's a community. And it's a really a wonderful thing. It's going to launch in March. And the website is getinflow.io. So that's getinflow.io, and you can sign up for the the uh, waiting list, and we'll announce it in March. So we'll we'll mark our calendars for March, and in the meantime, we can check out your work at sexcenter.com. You're in private practice in New York City, Doctor George Sachs. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. FOMO. Big news. We now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. 
To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.